Thank you. Welcome to the talk. Um, as he said, I'm going to be talking about tomographic and morphometric analysis in the Gulf of Alaska. Uh, I'd like to thank my committee members who are mostly um, co-authors on this talk. Some themes we're going to talk about today are edge detection and faults, um, drainage profiles, and tomography. For those of you that don't know, um, essentially tomography is using some sort of a wave to probe uh, properties of a substrate. In our case, we're going to be looking at sediments in the ocean and measuring their velocities. Um, this one's lots of text, I apologize for the text, but broadly speaking, glacial, tectonic, and sedimentation patterns are spatially related to depositional environments. Um, different depositional environments in the Gulf of Alaska result in sedimentologic variations that you can see in seismic analysis, as well as shape differences that we can see in bathymetric data. Um, this allows us to generate some testable predictions. Um, I've put them up here. Essentially, the idea is we can use edge detection to map faults in the Gulf of Alaska. Um, with respect to ice sheets that have been in and out of the, the Gulf, we can see um, U-shaped drainage profiles within the extent of the ice sheets and V-shaped away from that. Um, sedimentation associated with rapid burial may cause low velocity zones as we're Burying sediments, the fluid pressure is responding by increasing um, according to the mass that's loaded on there. And in our study, we're attempting to quantify these spatial relationships, particularly between gully profile shape and ice sheet extents. Where are we in the world? We are in southeast Alaska. Um, the San Andreas Fault would lead down to California here. Um, we're in this area where we have the Pacific Plate subducting underneath the North America Plate um, along the Aleutian Megathrust. We're going to be focusing on this area. There's also a, a micro plate sort of jammed into this corner here, um, and that causes some differences compared to farther south towards California or along the Aleutian Islands. So. We're going to focus on this area called the Pamplona Zone here in PZ. This is actually offshore. There's an onshore corollary called the Yakutaga Fold and Thrust Belt. And then on top of all of this, we have um, two major glaciers, which are remnants from larger ice sheets. I actually helped build this sandbox model in 2007 during my undergrad at Ohio State University, so that's why it's red and white. Um, and it illustrates pretty well what we expect to see in the Pamplona zone. It's a, an accumulation of sediment. So we start here um, and we increase compression on this thing and we see a series of stacked faults um, as well as associated folds. But in the real world, what we have is a lot more complexity. We have layers added onto this. We have glaciers and climate. We have sea level variations. And of course, we never have perfect data. Um, so what do, what do glaciers do? Well, this is what we would expect to see if we could slice through the Earth along where a glacier has advanced and receded. We would see um, patterns like this. Uh, essentially, as the ice advances, it bulldozes all this sediment into the ocean, um, destroying some of the previous sediment and filling in the basin. As it retreats, it also leaves sort of a trail of sediment behind it. So, I actually work with seismic data, and you'll see some of it today. Um, this is a seismic line from the Gulf of Alaska, and you can see it matches pretty well these patterns that uh, we see from you know, the research. You can see here a, a big erosional surface as well as some subglacial till, probably in these zones. So that's just what we have. We have this sediment wedge underneath um, topped with a glacial sequence. Um, this is a seismic line through the Pamplona zone um, that we outlined before, and we have our, our glacial system here feeding sediment on top of that. What happens when you load that sediment on top of this fault wedge system? Well, two things happen. Um, one is there's just excess weight from all that sediment. And in this geometry, if we put weight on on these faults, it's going to want to cause them to slide backwards this way. Um, so that's actually counter to um, active faults. So in some cases, we see that the faults have actually shut off, and as they've become buried, they're just not active anymore. Um, but the other thing that's going on here is, I mentioned this before, um, we're building fluid pressure. So 
the fluid pressure actually acts to lubricate the fault zone. And so when you have high fluid pressures, it's easier to slide along those fault planes. So sort of two competing processes here. So what do faults do? Um, we're talking a lot about faults here. Well, they store strain energy. And we can release that strain energy seismically or aseismically. Um, I have put a couple examples here. A seismic release of energy would be slow. You would barely detect it. And so on this um, diagram, the white dots here are low frequency events associated with just almost no seismicity sliding smoothly along these faults. Whereas if we had a rapid release of energy, such as been documented in the Gulf of Alaska numerous times, um, we could have tsunamis, other coastal hazards. Um, and which case you get depends on where the faults are, which faults are active, and how the faults are behaving. Um, what we see here is, again, a couple seismic lines. This one's been interpreted. We could imagine that we could try to restore these faults. Um, back to points that should be connected. So here, this point should be connected to down here. We could restore this for all the faults and estimate how much total shortening has happened as the Pacific plate is being subducted under North America. Uh, what we see is offshore about 13 kilometers, um, explained by what we see offsets in the seismic data. But we know that since about 3 million years ago, the total system has to have experienced about 120 kilometers of total convergence, uh, like I said, since about 3 million years ago. Um, in this image, we see um, two different ice sheet extents. Uh, the red lines on here are, are faults that do indeed correspond to this diagram. And we're going to look at some of these seismic lines throughout the talk. Uh, for reference, the last glacial maximum was probably about 20,000 years ago, and this one referred to as the glacial maximum is the maximum glacial extent within the last maybe 3 million years. Um, the age on that is a little bit debated. So we wanted to start out, I just started out sort of exploring the data, and I was looking at the bathymetry, and I said, oh, it looks like it matches up pretty well with the faults. What can we do here? So this sort of spawned my first mini project exploring this bathymetry. The data set here that I've used is smooth sheet bathymetry by um, Zimmerman. Um, I have a lightning talk that I'll talk more about the data set. But on the right here, I've compiled fault data from some of my advisor's work from the USGS, um, as well as a couple of other sources. So the different colors are different fault sets. So I ran the edge detection on here, and I did several different um, iterations of edge detection using Model Builder. Essentially, you build a, an operator, and then you apply focal statistics. What I found to be the best result was essentially um, Sobel horizontal and Sobel vertical. I've shown these neighborhood operators here, so they go in and operate on a pixel-by-pixel -pixel basis and decide whether or not we see an edge. So this is kind of a blow-up of the result. What we see here, black should be essentially identified as an edge whereas um, white is not an edge. So what we're seeing is, again, pretty good agreement. Um, we're seeing some structures in here that line up pretty well with faults, particularly down here on the lower slope. Um, and then we see some faults here. There are some other structures continuing on here that I think we could use this edge detection algorithm to sort of make a better fault map. So we could rectify all of these different interpretations into one, possibly centered around the results of this edge detection. In order to do this, we had to sort of make fault distance, we had to make faults you know, more than just a line on the map. So because we're comparing pixel to pixel. Um, what I did here to accomplish this was transform faults into fault distance. So instead of comparing just one line of the faults, I have a whole map of the region that's fault distance. Um, what we've seen here is that at short distances, the edge detection value is high, and that's what we expect if we think there's a correlation between this edge detection algorithm and our fault locations. Um, we actually did some stats here, and the R value was uh, 0.58, believe it or not, with this point cloud. Um, and it's a negative correlation when you look at the R squared, and, and that's why at short distances the value is high. This sort of led me to 
the other part of the project where we're going to look at profile morphology. This is pretty textbook where uh, rivers tend to create V-shapes and glaciers tend to create U-shapes. Um, that's how it works onshore. Offshore processes can be a little bit different. There are some uh, hypotheses proposed here by other research. I'm not going to talk about that. Another example of where we might get a different shape than just U or V is um, where you have the intersection of two lobate flows. You might accept, expect something to be sort of a square root shape. A lot of this was inspired by previous research by one of our collaborators, John Swartz, at University of Texas. He did a study um, looking at the shape index of profiles, essentially whether they're U or V-shaped. Um, and he took a profile across the mid-slope. This is again in the Gulf of Alaska. Um, and here's his results. He extracted the gullies from this and then measured their ran through some statistics and measured the best fitting power for this. So if you have a power of one, you're seeing a V-shape, whereas if you have a power of two or above, you're looking at more of a U-shaped profile. He also looked at longitudinal profiles. From his research, he was able to identify this zone of slope progradation, as well as areas where we're experiencing sediment bypass on the shelf and slope. This is his distribution of U and V shapes. So above this line, uh, he's seeing U-shaped profiles, whereas below it, we're looking at mostly V shapes. Our study is pretty similar, but we wanted to be a little more spatial, and we wanted to consider more variables. So we're going to look at all these comparisons, hopefully. I automated everything in Model Builder as much as I could. So this looks like a complex process, and some people are a little bit hesitant to get involved with Model Builder. But the hardest thing about this was thinking of names for the raster outputs, um, because you're limited to a certain number of characters. But basically, it works by loading the data, inverting and filling the DEM. We calculate the flow direction, and then I inserted an iterator into this process so that we could try out different um, accumulation thresholds to define our stream and ridge network. So this is what it looks like for the drainage network. We see here the colors are different accumulating cells. Um, but there are some problems with this. This is for ridges. So we're going to also apply some filtering to this, because we have a lot of long, straight segments that are probably not real in here and in here, as well as other ones that are harder to identify. Um, I have some more details about how he did this in my lightning talk later this afternoon, but this is essentially the final result. So we applied a series of filters. Um, Lynx mostly was the best filter that we had. Um, and then we also wanted to remove the effects of survey tracks because I noticed that near a lot of these edges I was excited about from the fault analysis actually lined up with instead survey tracks, and so they're probably not real data. Um, and this is something I'm continuing to work on resolving. But this is what we're going to move forward with. You see the, what we would call gullies in blue, and ridges are here in red. Now that we have our drainage network, we want to extract profiles. So again, we went to Model Builder, and what we do here is we smooth our stream network. Um, we want to take a subset of those lines, and then at that point, we add fields here. So where I say add fields needed, I'm adding the endpoints to this profile. And then we use the points to line tool to generate samples along that line. Um, again, here, we're going to worry about those survey tracks. And I've removed any data within a kilometer of a survey track. And finally, we use uh, extract multi-values uh, to build our data set that we're going to work with. It looks like this. You can see a, um, a gully here and two ridges crossed by a profile where we've taken samples. This is the distribution of samples we've taken. We've done 500 profiles randomly distributed throughout the Gulf of Alaska. Sorry, all of our profiles were five kilometers long, and we trimmed this in a, another software that I have written. So I actually wrote this little script in MATLAB. And in window one, it pops up your extracted profile data. Um, your job as the user of this software is to click on the minimum, the left max, and the right max. It extracts that profile data. And then it runs some statistics on it in window number two. 
We'll see an example here. Um, what I'm trying to do is find the best fitting power to the power function to see whether we're looking at sort of an exponent of one and we're looking at a linear shape or exponents of you know, one and a half or higher we're calling U-shaped. So you can see here we have our profile. Down here, um, 25 actually should be 2.5. This is saying the best fitting exponent is 2.5. So this is a pretty boxy profile, as you may expect. One more example. Um, here we have another one. We're going to zoom in on this little yellow box. And you can see that the resolution of possible shapes is pretty high here. So think of, think of these lines as possible shapes for the profile. So the green ones are, um, are between 1 and 2 for the exponent. In this case, we actually selected a green line as the best fit for this. This is the output of our results um, non-spatially compared to Swartz et al. Um, he took his in sort of an organized profile, whereas ours were randomly distributed. So this isn't the best comparison at this point. We wanted to make a, a surface of this. So we wanted to go beyond just doing a profile and go to a surface. We used the geostatistical wizard, and it's a nice automated way to fit a variety of surfaces. We had some problems with our profiles, so we didn't use all of them. In our analysis, we rejected some because they had not enough relief, or they were highly asymmetric, or there were just one or two sample points left after we filtered everything out. So you can see our final selected profiles that we move forward with here. Now we can really compare this to Swartz's work. So you see his mid-slope profile, and we took a mid-slope profile here. We actually overlap on some of these zones. So our, pro our map covers through zone a little bit into zone D. So I've output our profile down here. We've picked up this spike in U-shapes that he saw. And uh, we see a general agreement in the trend, although there's more statistics we could run here. Now we want to compare it to bathymetry, faults, et cetera, et cetera. So I've just plotted these maps, and we'll talk about a few of the observations here. Um, first, we see that shallow bathymetry is more associated with U-shaped profiles than deep bathymetry. So this line is pointing to the 200 meter contour. Um, some deeper U-shapes appear on the northwest flank of the surveyor fan, which I've highlighted here. This was something um, that Swartz was focused on. He identified this as a trough mouth fan. I, I agree. Um, and then in the southeast portion of the study area and near Kayak Island, we see shallow zones containing V-shaped profiles. And then finally, um, areas where we have sort of widely spaced bulging contours, we see that this is more often associated with U-shapes as well. Um, one hypothesis for getting these U-shapes besides just glacial activity is that these are actually slide scars, which tend to make a, a U-shape. With respect to the ice sheets, which I think is one of the most interesting results we have here, um, what I'm showing is the last glacial max and the maximum glacial extent again. Um, overlaid on our shape index map. What we see here is that two lobes of the last glacial maximum seem to split near the Kayak Island zone, and those are also matching up pretty well with um, U-shaped profiles. We see in the eastern area that one edge of the ice sheet during the last glacial max is sub-parallel to the one and a half uh, shape index contour, which above and below you know, we call U-shaped or V-shaped. And then Near the shallow zone surrounding the Kayak Island zone, we see um, the U and V contour subparallel to the maximum glacial extent. Now with respect to faults, um, just a few observations here. South of the Kayak Island zone, we see a really good agreement between the UV 1.5 contour and the transition fault. So the transition fault runs here. It's this black line, and our contour between the U and V shapes is running right along that. Um, suggesting maybe there's some fault control to profile shapes. Near the deformation front of our sediment wedge, what we see is um, two faults bracketing a narrow zone of V-shaped profiles. And again, we're near that 1.5 shape index contour. In the Pampelona zone proper, which is sort of this region, um, we see that the highest density of faults is also associated with um, more U-shaped profiles. And then finally, in Icy Bay, we see 
the UV 1.5 contour is change on either side of a fault. So actually here are some of these faults which don't continue across Icy Bay. I, I believe they do continue across Icy Bay. Um, so we had scatter plots for days. We'll just talk about the important ones, um, which were mostly related to the ice sheet extent. So what I was seeing in particular was within the ice sheets, which would be right along this axis in zero, we're inside the ice sheets, um, we're seeing sort of an average shape of U, so an exponent of 1.6, um, if you can read those numbers. And then as we move away from the ice sheet, we're actually decreasing and we fall into the V shape category. Um, we see that for both ice sheets. And then we also see maybe some kind of periodic function between the shape index and the the width. Um, so now we want to sort of bring in the tomography story to all this. And we have a distribution of seismic lines here. Um, and I've run some tomography code on this. Here's sort of another view. We're looking into the corner of these two seismic lines. So we're actually able to see slices in depth. I showed this seismic line earlier. Um, so this lets us sort of generate some hypotheses just by looking in 3D. Um, so first of all, our first hypothesis was ice sheet mass and sedimentation during retreat may have left a low velocity signature. So low velocity would be associated with um, high fluid pressures, possibly due to deformation. And then our, our second hypothesis here, sedimentation associated with rapid burial is associated with lower velocity zones. So how does this work? Um, this is sort of a, an interpreted seismic line here. We see an erosional surface where the glacier came through, and then we see maybe some slope deposits. And so basically, this glacier came in and bulldozed all of this sediment on top of this pre-existing sediment, and the loading of that may have caused overpressure. And then the second side of this is that maybe just the mass of this glacier and the sediments that it left behind as it retreated left behind an overpressure signature as well. How does the tomography work? You, you get a starting model um, of what you think it might look like, and then you take your seismic observations and you adjust the velocities in your starting model until you have a lower residual error between your um, observations and your synthetic. This is what it looks like for steep nine, which is one we're talking about. Um, from this, I could identify three possible zones of lower velocities. We look at the seismic data, which is actually recorded in time, and overlay it. In order to overlay um, our velocity model in depth in a seismic line, we have to transform our velocity model to time. So our, axis, our depth axis here is actually time. Here's our three zones again, and how they line up with the seismic data. So zones one and three are probably just simply related to burial, whereas zone two, I think, could be related to faulting. So if you sort of move things around in the subsurface, something has to give, and if there's nowhere to go, um, you're just gonna build up higher and higher fluid pressures, and we may see that result in our um, seismic lines. For our other seismic line that we did tomography, it looks like this and we have decided on just one um, low velocity zone here, overlaid on our seismic data. This really lets you see how the structure um, responds to, how the structure and the velocity relate to each other. So there's our one overpressure zone again, and it's probably confined to here. We don't really have great resolution at the seafloor, so I didn't feel too bad about drawing it this way. I may change it as the research develops. Just another 3D view here. Um, again, we're in the depth axis, and now we're in the time axis. So these aren't exactly um, comparable. That's one of the challenges of seismic data, is you're looking at a recording in time. But we took these um, velocity models, and we used ArcGIS to extract velocity profiles as slices through here. Um, and we used buffers to guide our results here. So I just digitized in the seafloor and did a series of buffers. Um, we did this for each seismic line, and the profiles are approximately like this. You can see that we're crossing our low velocity zone in each, and it's most apparent um, at shallower depths. You can see velocities here are less than they are here. 
less, a little bit choppy here. And in, um, in this line, we can actually see maybe a larger signature of the loading total from the glaciers. How do we relate this back to our shape index? Well, we're going to try to use the kolmogorov smirnov test, which simply tests if two samples are from the same distribution. Um, so we're going to use our UV shape index and our velocity slices to see if they could possibly be from the same distribution, to see if they're related. This is an example that I did on another study between the last glacial max and the slope break. So I looked at the orientation of um, each of those and was seeing how related they could be according to the KS test. And what we found was that these are actually from a similar distribution, so the last glacial max shape is actually pretty similar to the slope break, another study. Um, so we're going to compare our velocity profiles to our shape index profiles now, and we've extracted them here. So these are profiles of our shape index. Um, again, this is increased by a factor of 10, so it should actually be like 1.7 here and 1.6. Um, the results kind of look like this. We got the best match overall on um, steep nine, the shallowest profile. But we ran this for many iterations. And what we saw was that we couldn't say within statistical parameters of you know 5% anyways, that they were from the same distribution. So the shape index and the velocities that we're seeing don't appear to be related to each other. But if you're willing to accept a little bit higher p-values, we actually had 36% of our results that said they were from the same distribution, whereas only 14%, although they were statistically significant, said that they were not from the same data set. Um, so we can't really say overall that there's a relationship here between the velocities and the shape index, but I think there's some hope just based on this statistic. When you look back at our profiles here, we only ranged from about um, 17, 18 to 16. So had we had a longer line that sampled more sort of U and V shapes, we might have been able to tease out that relationship. So that's where I want to go with this a little bit in the future. Um, so just in summary here, some of our big conclusions um, with respect to edge detection. I think there's some hope here that we could use edge detection to map faults. Um, I think we need some more data sets because you know, R of like 0.58 isn't going to cut it. Um, but with profile morphology, I think we had some good results where we could see that we had more U-shapes within the glacial extents. And as we moved away, we were seeing a pretty good relationship that we became more V-shaped. And that's an interesting one. I'd like to improve this by getting a better uh, drainage identification, so sort of a better drainage network. Um, I'd like to focus on a smaller area with a little bit better data. And then the velocity modeling results are a little bit in um, development here, but we were able to document several zones of low velocity on both of our seismic lines, although we didn't see any um, apparent relationship between those velocities and the profile shapes. Um, there's some drilling data I'd like to integrate in with this, as well as um, some empirical relationships that we can use to actually estimate the amount of compaction from our velocity models. And that's, that's what I have for you. Any questions?